wonder when uh, you collect stories on people, how things are distorted. Like if mm. the truth really shines. We'll find out, we'll find out. Hi guys, can you first just introduce yourself, name, role? Matteo Danieli, co-founder, chief product officer. Luca Ferrari, co-founder, chief executive officer. Let's start at the beginning, at the University of Padua. Classic sliding doors uh, kind of story, like one in a million. That one time I just went uh, down during recess uh, and waited in line behind a couple other students to ask a question and Francesco Patarnello, aka Kiko, happened to be just ahead of me so we started chatting and uh, ended up uh, making friends with, uh, with Kiko. Yeah. Later on there was this double degree uh, option and we both got selected and ended up in Copenhagen for the same, uh, uh, yeah, let's call it exchange. And so we ended up in this place, which uh, was a lot of fun, pretty packed. Yeah, we couldn't help uh, uh, get even closer. Physically, like really, the Very container close. was pushing you to go. Yeah, yeah. If I say J-Day, what does it make you think of? So J-Day, Yule Day, it means Christmas Day, even though it's the first day of October, or the first week of October. Typically, the way it works is that the average Dane will go to their favorite pub. They'll stay there, they'll wait for the uh, truck to come by, and there's gonna be a little celebration for the new beer that comes in. So it happened that I was uh, in the center of Copenhagen with, uh, with some friends, and uh, after the third bar that we visit to get some, some free beer, I bump into this guy speaking Italian who had lost his friends. We strike up a conversation, and this guy happened to be Francesco. And, you know, once again, sliding doors, I mean, what are the chances? It turned out that we were studying in the same university at home. We took the same exchange program in Denmark. We were just one year apart. Our reciprocal first impression was great, and that's how we, um, you know, we started this, this friendship. And, um, and in the morning, uh, we wake up, and he tells me that uh, uh, he met another Italian person downtown, and that this person uh, would be visiting uh, shortly in the morning because he was such a great guy. And so the person comes and it happens to be Matteo. And uh, I hated him. I thought it looked, I don't know, just quite, quite conceited, full of himself, a bit of a brat. So how did you end up as friends building something together? Yeah, the short of it is that we, we were sick and tired of this campus village. It was great, but super packed. And uh, so we wanted to do, uh, make a move downtown, have our own flat. Keiko and I had to recruit others to uh, fill the flat. And uh, Matteo was at the time uh, moving out of his apartment for a bunch of reasons. And so he was one of the recruits. Back in the days I was working as a PhD student at my university, didn't really like the um, uh, you know, what I was studying, I wasn't really satisfied with it. So it was this trip that we had waited for, for a very long time. And uh, wow, it's a great, great chance to, to bond and to, you know, talk about the future, what we wanted to do with ourselves. And that's also where I think some of our desire and interest in building something, perhaps building something together, started surfacing, I think. And the idea for the startup we, yeah. we built initially yeah. for Ben and Spoons, Evertail. The idea for Evertail, which was the, um, the idea that we worked on before starting Bending Spoons, came as a consequence of us having this trip uh, all around this place, Bali, taking a lot of photos, not being able to remember specifically what these photos were taken, and uh, you know, wondering if there was a better way to kind of go back in time and uh, relieve your memory than simply scrolling through the photos in your phone. So in a way, yes, that trip also gave us uh, our idea, which you know, didn't really go very well, but you know, it was our first uh, taste of what it means to be an entrepreneur. It depends. You can never judge a single dot. You need to judge the whole line, I think. The day that we uh, determined the project had failed, although it was painful and had been a very painful period, I think it was the most energizing moment for me in a long time. I've made so many mistakes, now I get a chance to make different ones, I, I couldn't wait. It was, there was not a second in my mind where I doubted that I wanted to, to do it again. Tell me about that guy that you hired at Evertail, Luca Corella. Yeah, so I think that sometimes the um, very wrong process gives you the very right people, and that's exactly what happened with Luca Corella. We posted uh, an opening on LinkedIn. We got perhaps 10, 15 applications, went through them without even knowing what we were looking for, interviewed this guy, seemed nice, 
hired him. Two people were interviewed. <laughs> Two people were interviewed. And, and the funny thing is that he didn't know much about JavaScript and he was basically reading some books and learning it you know, in the hour prior to the, to the interview. He passed anyway. Well, we didn't ask any JavaScript questions. We didn't ask any JavaScript well, questions. No. Um, okay, but that was back then. What's it like now? You know, our recruiting process, what, what we try to do there is we try to have a recruiting process that is extremely ob objective. Whenever you have to do with people, there's a number of biases that enter the picture and you want to avoid at all costs. So something that we try to bake in uh, as soon as possible in the process was, um, you know, meritocracy and objectivity. I also add that something that's quite uh, distinctive the way we do it is that in my experience, most companies, when they assess someone to hire, they see the person as fixed, as a snapshot. We always think of people as a function that evolves in time, and we take pride in selecting people who have a lot of growth ahead of themselves, and then putting them in a situation where they can achieve all that growth. So we, we don't really think about you today, we try to picture what you can be, how great you can be in a few years' time. So I have a photo here, Let's take a look at it. What do you see? I see a bunch of guys. Uh, and one Alicia. <laughs> and one Alicia. <laughs> Back in the days when we were at uh, this co-working uh, space, it was amazing you know, to see how with the growth of the company, we would constantly be changing the place where we operated. So at the very beginning, August 2014, we only had a desk, but then soon we started hiring many more people. And so we moved to having a couple of desks four desks, then we couldn't be in the co-working area any longer, so we rent a full room, then we rent two rooms, and pretty soon it became apparent that we needed to find a different solution. And that's how, uh, you know, finally we, uh, we, we then got this, this office uh, here, and, and the next ones that will accompany our growth. Wow, that was a small office for a lot of people, but a lot of good memories as well. What did you take from your Evertail adventure to Bending Spoons? You're the right one to answer this. Am I? Yeah. I'll give you two things. One is the importance of the team. At the time, we put together the team in a very superficial way. We got lucky with a couple of people, but for the most part, um, it was a disaster. And the second one was uh, that it's critical not to be, to have the arrogance of thinking you know what will work and what won't. I, I think you share the same feeling, but there's something that tells us that being together you know, giving it a try and building something great, having the ambition of doing it is much more important than the individual project. And that's something we carried along with us. So that's what matters. That's what gives us energy. I guess it depends on the motivations why you do things. Sometimes people want to be an entrepreneur because it's cool. I mean, at least it's becoming cool. Maybe it wasn't as much in the past, but that will not get you far, I feel, because it's very painful. It's not a job I would recommend. But if you do it for reasons that are long-lasting and, uh, and deep, then I think it's almost a vocation in a way. I don't want to overstate it, but it's a, it's a kind of thing that you couldn't see yourself doing anything else. Had we not believed that great things were possible, we would never be here. So I'm not saying that your belief that you could do great things necessarily implies that you will, but if you don't at least start there, you'll never get there. And, uh, and that's what I hope that Bending Spoons will communicate. Once again, we're still far, from what we dream and what we believe we'll get to, but for sure we're much closer than we were uh, nine years ago. And I think we'll know that we have succeeded if in you know, 10 or 20 years time, mm -hmm. by the standards of that, of that stage, uh, what we are today will look like so small, you don't even see it. It's just, just resolution is not enough to, to see it. Um, I'm not sure we'll get there, but uh, that's you know, the kind of thing you you either get there or die trying, as they say. Yeah. That's where we're headed. Exactly.